what are some of the influences on weight loss maintenance? What things can we attend to that are going to increase the probability that someone can maintain their weight loss in the long term? So we're going to talk about five main categories of things. We're going to discuss dietary composition and how that impacts things. We'll look at physical activity. We'll look at self-monitoring and accountability. We will look at the food environment and some of the things that would influence overeating. And then we'll look at some psychological factors that can play a role here. So going to the first of those, diet composition, many of this will be similar to the principles of a fat loss diet, but with some slight differences. So within research, we see that as with most things, a healthy dietary pattern is associated with long-term weight loss maintenance. So something like the DASH diet, um, it, which is a healthy dietary pattern, is associated with long-term weight loss maintenance. Similarly, diets that are have a high intake of fruits and vegetables and so on. So nothing really different to what you would be advising people anyway. So we want to make sure we're still continuing to advise an overall dietary pattern that is made up of healthy foods, including high amounts of fiber, high amounts of vegetables, some inclusion of whole grains rather than refined grains, et cetera, et cetera. With protein intake, we see better outcomes for higher protein intakes than for very low protein intakes. And there are some number of reasons that we could maybe uh, suggest for this, whether that relates to the satiety value of high protein meals, also the benefit for maintaining muscle mass, which again can play a beneficial role. Fiber itself, again, can play a role in satiety and satiation, can be more filling. And then diets that are higher in fiber may mean that they have a low calorie density. And generally, meals of low calorie density can be predictive of uh, long-term weight loss maintenance. So trying to get people eating meals that can still have a large volume of food on their plate, but for relatively little calories. So this would be meals that, again, high in fibrous vegetables, inclusion of things like legumes and other whole grains, having water-based meals, so whether that's like soups or stews and so on, things that have a large volume to keep people satisfied, but the calorie contribution is relatively low and not relying on very calorie-dense foods. Unsurprisingly, the processing and palatability of foods also relates to how much someone is then likely going to eat. And so making sure that, again, the majority of their intake isn't coming from ultra processed foods or hyper palatable foods. Again, this is something that you will have been doing anyway from that weight loss phase, no doubt. And then there is also that individual response and adherence to all these previous issues. So on a diet composition level, there's nothing really new that's outstanding from a weight loss maintenance perspective. It's doing all those fundamentals that you would probably be doing in a weight loss phase itself, or generally just trying to implement from a healthy eating perspective, but just making sure someone can stick to all of those things. And then also knowing that after a diet, someone is going to have those drives to increase their energy intake and gain weight back. And so we want to try and mitigate some of the hunger that will arise after a diet is over. And this is where things like protein, fiber, and low calorie dense meals can be uh, useful. One of the things that probably is most strongly associated with long-term weight loss maintenance is physical activity. So we have very strong evidence that high levels of physical activity will increase the probability of weight loss maintenance. In that Thomas study I referenced earlier, which was that 10-year follow-up of the National Weight Control Registry, decreases in physical activity were associated with the greatest amount of weight regain. So the people who regained the most that were on that registry were the people who had decreased their physical activity the most in that follow-up period. And one of the things that probably contributes to this is not just the decrease in energy expenditure that comes when we do less physical activity, but with very low levels of physical activity, it seems that we have an inability to properly regulate appetite and therefore our calorie intake. And so looking at some of this research, going from a uh, low amount of activity up to high, we tend to see an increase 
in calorie intake. And this makes complete sense that the more energy we're expending each day, those people will require more calories. So people that are spending a ton of activity throughout the day with maybe a, a manual job, they do a lot of uh, activity throughout the day, and maybe they're doing a lot of hard charging exercise and have a really high energy expenditure, then for them, even to maintain weight would require a lot of calories. And so their body is naturally going to be driven to consume more calories. So we get this nice linear line. However, what we see when you go from a relatively low amount of activity to being completely sedentary and not doing any physical activity is that curve starts to go back up. So an increase in caloric intake where it's highest for people who are completely sedentary. And so what the group at Leeds have called this is having a regulated zone. So in other words, as you increase or decrease physical activity, your body has does a good job of matching your calorie intake to that. But then at very low levels of activity, it becomes unregulated. So your body isn't good at sensing how many calories it needs to consume and you end up over consuming intake. And so there's a potential here for why not doing much physical activity can lead to that weight regain, even aside from the energy expenditure you get from activity. So some of the targets that we see is about 200 to 300 minutes of physical activity per week seems to be uh, correlated with weight loss maintenance. Probably strength training plus aerobic training is superior than just doing aerobic training alone. However, there should be some focus placed on activities that the individual finds pleasurable, enjoys doing, and maybe has a social element to them. All of those things tend to increase the likelihood they stick to them and stay doing them consistently. So physical activity that's done consistently all the time over the long term is going to be most important. So relying on activities that have some degree of enjoyment for that person or they like doing or have something like a reason like a social element to the activity or having a community of people that they enjoy meeting up with that does this activity are all going to be likely to make that physical activity more part of their lifestyle in the long term. The next of those factors that can influence weight loss maintenance is around self-monitoring. Now with a long-term goal what we want to get to is to have less and less need for very diligent, very precise tracking of calorie intake and body weight. So what we want to move away from is rather than having very precise tracking methods is to putting more emphasis on eating habits, recognition of those hunger cues that we have internally, being consistent with exercise, and then just general behaviors in our overall lifestyle. And so that's the kind of goal that in the long term we'd like to move towards. Now, with that said, there's relatively consistent research showing that people who weigh themselves on a daily basis or very regularly and self-monitor their food intake in some form tend to have better outcomes in terms of weight loss maintenance. We see this quite consistently that those, both of those things, that self-monitoring of body weight, self-monitoring of eating behavior are predictive of weight loss maintenance success. However, it should be very clear that on an individual level, there are cases where self-monitoring by either of these methods can be contraindicated. So for someone who is in a position where they overly obsess about food and overly obsess about tracking intake and worry too much about calories in different meals, then tracking calories and macronutrients would be a bad idea for that person and shouldn't be used. In a similar fashion, there are people who are overly obsessive about scale weight and worry too much about uh, their weigh-in weights. And so trying to do a weigh-in every day is probably going to be more problematic from a psychological perspective. And so that can be avoided. So these are not things that need to be done. They're not the only possible tools for someone to be accountable and to self-monitor, but they are just two that we see associations with. So if this is something that may be useful to people, then having a regular check on both uh, weigh-in or some other form of monitoring body composition might be useful. And at the same time, self-monitoring food intake. Now that doesn't necessarily mean tracking calories and macronutrients in an app. It could be keeping a food diary. It could be keeping pictures of meals. It could be some other form of 
of just monitoring overall food intake, but having some mechanism where people are aware of what they're doing seems to be beneficial for that weight loss maintenance. And again, to clarify, there are some caveats to that. There are some cases where that would be contraindicated. So again, use your coaching judgment. And there's probably other lectures that are no doubt within the portal where people talk about some of those contraindications.